हेलो स्टूडेंट्स सो नाउ आई विल डिस्कस विथ यू टू कंडीशंस व्हिच आर द स्पेक्ट्रम ऑफ सेम कंडीशन दैट इज वीनस थ्रोम्बो एम्बोलिज्म डीव बेन थ्रोम्बोसिस एंड पल्मरी एम्बोलिज्म राइट नाउ डीव बेन थ्रोम्बोसिस डीवीटी एंड पल्मरी एम्बोलिज्म टुगेदर कंप्राइजेस अ डिजीज प्रोसेस कॉल्ड वीनस थ्रोम्बो एम्बोलिज्म इट इज अ रिलेटिवली कॉमन डायग्नोसिस Now, sixty thousand hospitalization per year is for DVT, right? So it is not an uncommon condition. It is a common condition, and venous thromboembolism, a uh, disease of uh, uh, venous thromboembolism, uh, can be very deadly disease, right? If we do not keep it as a differential diagnosis, right, during our diagnostic workup, then it may be missed. so it is not a very uncommon condition it is a common condition and should always be kept in mind during diagnostic work up in emergency department right so what is deep vein venous system and what is this deep vein thrombosis what is deep venous system the deep venous systems are veins of lower extremities which includes anterior tibial posterior tibial and peroneal veins popliteal vein calf vein then popliteal vein femoral vein and external iliac vein and even superficial femoral vein though it's superficial written superficial but despite of its name superficial it also comes under deep venous system so deep venous system comprises of popliteal vein calf vein right calf vein popliteal vein femoral vein external iliac vein and superficial venous system right now diagnosis of dvt is extremely difficult right it is extremely difficult we should always have a high suspicion of index right because why it is difficult to diagnose because of very atypical presentation patient to patient the presentation may vary so we need to have a high index of suspicion to understand the work up and ruling out disease process in emergency department so depending upon the clinical features which it can present with if i come across those clinical features i always do a work up to rule out this embolism right from uh, venous thromboembolism right so we always have to have a high index of suspicion we always have to build diagnostic workups in such a way that we can rule out this condition okay so whenever a patient comes deep vein thrombosis patient would not come with unstable uh, for airway breathing and circulation but pulmonary embolism patient right can come up as an unstable patient so since we are taking both together so let me tell you that whenever in a primary survey initial stabilization in pulmonary thromboembolism initially abc evaluation has to be done so if a patient present with pulmonary embolism abc evaluation is must pulmonary embolism patient always presents right as shortness of breath patient will have dyspnea chest pain fatigue and number of other non specific symptoms so patient will have chest pain this patient will be dyspneic right patient will be dyspneic and patient will have number of other non specific complaint like fatigue etc etc massive pulmonary embolism can is often fatal it can lead to cardiac arrest right so massive pulmonary embolism would immediately cause obstructive shock and will lead to pulseless electrical activity heart can pump because of obstruction it cannot perfuse so massive pulmonary embolism is often fatal has often fatal presentation as cardiac arrest so the presentation spectrum is very wide patient may come with a mild chest pain dyspnea fatigue and other non specific symptoms or patient may come with massive pulmonary embolism patient may land up in cardiac arrest right so presentation is very wide depending upon the upon the embolism emboli depending upon the size of emboli right as with other chest pain or 
patient complaining as with other patient complaining chest pain and shortness of breath patient with suspected pulmonary embolism should have stabilization of abc cardiac monitor should be attached all the monitor should be attached ecg etc iv access should be taken and supplemental oxygen has to be attached a initial ecg chest pain a 12 lead ecg has to be obtained right chest x ray should be obtained and we should rapidly evaluate for other dds as well right if patient is complaining chest pain right and shortness of breath so there are so many other dds also so patient should be evaluated for pulmonary embolism and also for other differential diagnosis after stabilizing after attaching monitors and after attaching oxygen to the patient right so initial abc evaluation is very important now if a patient is in deep vein thrombosis now going into dvt deep vein thrombosis the presentation is very subtle the complaint would be generalized include general leg pain or cramping sensation fullness in the calf swelling edema or tenderness on palpation right a localized tenderness on palpation swelling in one particular limb edema fullness of the calf cramping sensation right leg pain etc the differential diagnosis of dvt includes musculoskeletal strain or tear cellulitis thromb superficial thrombophlebitis venous insufficiency lymphedema or popliteal cyst right so any superficial thrombophlebitis or popliteal cyst or lymphedema cellulitis may also have same kind of presentations like dvt right so what are the classical findings on physical examination of pulmonary thromboembolism and dvt so what should make us think towards the direction of the diagnosis of pulmonary thromboembolism or dvt in case of deep vein thrombosis the classical findings on physical examination unilateral swelling or edema of the extremity tenderness on palpation palpable venous cord the venous cord would be palpable homan sign homan signs is a classical sign of pain in calf on passive dorsiflexion of foot with knee extension dorsiflexion of foot and knee on a knee extension right with knee in extended position and foot is dorsiflexed calf there is a pain in the calf calf muscle so this is called homan sign this is neither sensitive nor specific for dvt but historically important so just keep it in mind now what do we do what is our history what should we focus on history and what is our primary survey in dvt patient now since it has wide dds differential diagnosis there is a pretest probability developed for diagnosing deep vein thrombosis there is wells pretest probability for dvt all the features of that pretest probability should be taken during history to give a probability of to see how much is the probability of diagnosing dvt so according to wells pretest probability of diagnosis of dvt the history should be our subjected to that so all the points which comes in the wells pretest probability for diagnosing dvt should be asked in the history so the risk factor which may help to estimate the risk of venous thromboembolism in the patient should always be taken in the history to calculate a, we have to calculate a pretest probability the well score is a clinical decision rule developed to assist in determining the probability of dvt as well as pulmonary embolism which help us to guide towards a future workup so when i take the history and do a primary workup primary survey of patient in dvt we take the history we try to calculate the risk according to wells pretest probability and then according to the calculated risk our further workup is is in that direction so what is wells pretest probability for dvt diagnosis few things we have to ask 
If patient has active cancer treatment in previous six months, we give one point. Patient had a hist has a history of paralysis, paralysis, or recent immobilization. One point again. Patient was immobilized, recently immobilized, has a history of paralysis or weakness of the limb. Bedridden for more than three months, within more uh, for more than three days, or major surgery. Patient was bedridden due to some any condition for more than three days, or had a major surgery within twelve weeks. Again, one point. Localized tenderness in the distribution of deep venous system. Throughout the deep venous system, if there is any localized tenderness, okay. Again, a one point we give. If the entire leg of the patient is swollen, again a one point. Calf swelling at least three centimeter greater than other side. There is a swelling in the calf three centimeter greater than other side. One point. Pitting edema confined to the involved symptomatic leg. Again, one point. Collateral superficial vein. One point. Previously documented DVT. Previously, patient was diagnosed documented to have DVT. One point. Alternative diagnosed, at least as likely as DVT. During the history, some alternative diagnosis. Chances of some alternative diagnosis is very likely. Then we will minus two points from this, and then it is calculated. If the score is zero, low probability. If the score is one to two, moderate probability. And if the score is more than three, there is a high probability, right, of deep vein thrombosis. And if the probability is high, then there are few investigations which are directed towards diagnosing DVT, right? I will talk about how do we diagnose DVT just after talking about the clinical features of pulmonary embolism. And when do we suspect high risk of patient having pulmonary embolism? So, classical presentation of pulmonary embolism includes complaint of shortness of breath or chest pain. Patient has dyspnea and chest pain. Additionally, patient additionally syncope or patient has vague complaint of general malaise, deterioration, functional deterioration. Right? Patient may have pleuritic chest pain and may have a history of unilateral DVT like symptoms right patient may have leg swelling or may present patient present with right sided heart failure jugular vein dysfunction distension and peripheral edema right so if i am examining the patient patient has come to me with chest pain patient is complaining shortness of breath right patient has additionally the history of syncope patient has vague symptoms like functional deterioration patient has a history of dvt or patient has one limb swollen if not diagnosed dvt but there are chances of dvt patient has features of right sided heart failure right then there is a high risk of pulmonary thromboembolism the most important vital sign during physical examination right of pulmonary thromboembolism pointing towards pulmonary thromboembolism is patient is having tachycardia in presence of normal pulse pressure and oxygenation patient has a normal pulse pressure normal oxygen pulse duration everything oxygenation and patient still having tachycardia this is one most common vital sign abnormality seen in pulmonary thromboembolism so if my patient has tachycardia in spite of normal pulse pressure and patient is having chest pain patient is having some neurological symptoms maybe syncope etc then their probability of chance of pulmonary thromboembolism becomes high just like dvt there is a pre test probability of high suspicion of index for pulmonary thromboembolism as well so during taking the history in case of pulmonary thromboembolism we have to consider those points also in history to calculate a pre -te pre test risk right so what are the features which point us towards the pulmonary thromboembolism clinical symptoms of dvt deep vein thrombosis 
three points. If there is clinical symptoms of DVT along with the clinical features of pulmonary thromboembolism, three points. Other diagnosis less likely than pulmonary embolism. Other diagnosis, other DDs less likely, right? Three points. Heart rate more than 100, 1.5 points. Immobilization for three days or surgery in past four weeks. Again, 1.5 times. Previous deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, 1.5 times or points. Patient having hemoptysis, 1 point. Patient malignancy, having malignancy, 1 point. So, previous DVT, previous pulmonary embolism, patient have clinical symptoms of DVT if not previously diagnosed, they all increase the risk of pulmonary thromboembolism. So, clinical probability, low probability if the calculated risk is less than 2, moderate if 2 to 6 and high probability if it is 6, above 6, more than 6. So, how do I make the diagnosis? Chest x-ray in this patient, any patient with chest pain, dyspnea, we always go for chest x-ray. Chest x-ray is useful not for diagnosing pulmonary thromboembolism, but for ruling out the other diagnosis, right? If patient has pneumothorax or congestive heart failure or pneumonia, that could be suggestive from chest x-ray. So, we can go for chest x-ray and there are two signs which is unique for pulmonary thromboembolism, though not seen in every patient, can be asked in exam. So, there are two signs in chest x-ray which can be unique for pulmonary thromboembolism. One is Hampton's hump and other is Westermark's sign. So, what is this Hampton's hump? Unilateral atelectasis, right? Sometimes we can see a unilateral atelectasis or Hampton's hump. That is pulmonary infarct leading to pleural wedge shaped area of infiltrate, right? There is a wedge shaped area of infiltrate or Westmark sign that is unilateral lung oligemia, right? There is because of the emboli, emboli, the area distant to the emboli, there is a unilateral lung oligemia or infarct, right? That's called Westmark sign. Hampton's hump or Westmark signs are signs seen in pulmonary thromboembolism in chest x-ray. Historical importance, not very pathognomic and not seen in every patient. X-ray of lower extremities may be very helpful in workup of DVT, right? Because it will not only help us in ruling out the other skeletal injury related to leg pain or swelling, right? So, it will completely rule out the other localized which can cause swelling of the leg and pain etc. and rule out those conditions. So, x-ray of lower extremities, extremities always done if we suspect DVD, okay? ECG findings, very non-specific. Now, ECG finding one is as I told you in pulmonary thromboembolism is sinus tachycardia in spite of normal pulse pressure or what we can see is a strain, right heart strain pattern, right? We can see a right bundle branch block or evidence of right heart strain, an S wave in lead 1, a Q wave and an inverted T wave in lead 3, right? Lead 1 and Q and an inverted T wave in lead 3. That is S1, Q3, Q3, T3 pattern. That is a right heart strain pattern. So, in lead 3, we can see a Q and inverted T wave. Right? So, we see a right heart strain pattern may be seen. Now, diagnostic test. One is something called D-dimer test is done. Now, D-dimer test is not a very specific test. Now, utility of D-dimer test is only in when the pretest probability of diagnosing these conditions is high. If I get a high pretest probability of diagnosing these conditions with a D-dimer positive, then D-dimer is helpful. Otherwise, D-dimer is not a very helpful test. What is this D-dimer? What is the utility of D-dimer? Right? D-dimer is a protein-derived enzymatic breakdown product of cross-linked fibrins. It is a protein derived from enzymatic breakdown of cross-linked fibrins. Right? An increased level is present if present in present of clot formation somewhere in the body. So, anywhere if there is a clot formation, 
D dimer will increase and it can be elevated in many diseases in malignancy, in infection, inflammation, MI, stroke, advanced age, pregnancy. So it is very non-specific. If there is high pretest score, high risk in pretest scoring with a D dimer positive, then maybe we can go in the direction that it is most probably pulmonary thromboembolism. But this is not a very specific test. Now, what are the specific tests for DVT? The for DVT, the diagnostic modality is venous duplex ultrasonography. Venous duplex ultrasonography. It's the diagnostic test of choice for most centers to diagnose DVT. Now, what is the classical finding in ultrasound for positive study in DVT? That is inability to compress the vein in deep vein venous system of the leg. Whichever limb I am suspecting the DVT. If we are unable to right, fully compress that vein during ultrasonography, it is most probably that deep vein thrombosis has developed. Right? So, venous duplex ultrasonography is currently the diagnostic test of choice in most centers for DVT. For pulmonary thromboembolism, for pulmonary thromboembolism, right? Patient with moderate or high pretest probability for pulmonary thromboembolism, the imaging study should be done. There are two tests. One is CT pulmonary angiography and other is VQ scan, ventilation perfusion scan. Now, VQ scan has a lot of limitations in number of patients. So, CT pulmonary angiography is now accepted study. It is an accepted study for diagnosis of pulmonary thromboembolism in most of the emergency department. So, CTPA is the most accepted study for diagnosis of pulmonary thromboembolism. And the benefit of CT is that it will not only diagnose from pulmonary thromboembolism, it will also help us in ruling out the other causes, other DDs of the chest pain and uh, the symptoms, pleuritic plurid chest pain or let's say hemoptysis etc. in the patient. If patient of pulmonary thromboembolism, dyspnea, chest pain, patient comes, it has so many differential diagnoses. The CT can also help in ruling out the other differential diagnosis. So, not, not, not only helps in diagnosing the condition, it also helps in ruling out the other causes of thromboembolism, other causes, other differential diagnosis of pulmonary thromboembolism. So, if by CT, the thromboembolism is established, what is the treatment? Those with confirmed pulmonary embolism or DVT on imaging should be treated with anticoagulation. Either unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin like enoxaparin may be used in most of the cases. Right? Sometimes when pre the pretest probability is very high and the patient has the symptoms with high pretest probability, even without establishing the diagnosis by imaging modality, people we can start the anticoagulation. The only contraindication of starting anticoagulation is that if patient has some active bleeding, cerebral or GI bleeding, or patient has a history of heparin allergy, right? If patient cannot be put on anticoagulant, you can go for IVC filter. A IVC filter is placed for filtering the thrombins. Now, number of centers doesn't have IVC filters. And cannot go, and these patients also cannot go for uh, anticoagulation. Then, in those settings, thrombolytic therapy can be used. But thrombolytic therapy used in pulmonary thromboembolism is uh, very controversial. It should only be restricted as a life-saving measure in massive pulmonary embolism with a significant cardiopulmonary compromise. Right? So, thrombolytic therapy is not a favored therapy, only should be limited for massive thromboembolism with severe cardiovascular compromise. Okay? Generally, for a patient with pulmonary thromboembolism is admitted in the hospital for anticoagulation. So, uh, if 
patient has a massive pulmonary thromboembolism patient needs a icu admission so from emergency department if patient has a massive pulmonary thromboembolism has been most made a most probable diagnosis or established diagnosis and patient is in cardio pulmonary compromised state the patient should be shifted to icu otherwise a stable patient can be managed disposed to ward they should be admitted because they are to be they are to be kept on anticoagulants right they are to be kept on anticoagulants patient with isolated dvt without pulmonary embolism are sent up with anticoagulation with anticoagulation at home right subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin a uh, low molecular weight heparin with anti oral anticoagulation etc just they need a regular follow up they are also like uh, they need to come on opd basis rather than getting admitted in hospital so mostly dvts patient with uh, dvt uh, can be discharged with after starting the anticoagulants in them right and patient with pulmonary thromboembolism are disposed either to ward or to icu dependent upon the amount of compromise they are in right thank you